Hi everyone, welcome to the Creatives Across Borders podcast with your host Bayo. My guest, Ori Beladi, is an intriguing character to say the least. She's a toy maker, a 3D maker, and painter, which is fascinating. Even more is the fact that her journey started from the kitchen. Yes, the kitchen. Ori practiced and worked as a chef for 16 years across Venezuela, India, Portugal, Spain, and the Netherlands. Today, through her persistence, perseverance, and quest for excellence, Ori has found a way to translate her creativity in the kitchen to toy making. In this interview, she walks us through her journey, processes, mentors, projects, struggles, high points, and more. If, like me, you are curious about 3D printing, this is also a very educative interview as she breaks it all down to the basics. I have included chapters so you can navigate to different segments within the interview. Enjoy! Okay, all good. Uh, so, yeah, nice. <laughs> in, yay! Yeah. So, good to have you, Ori. Is it Ori or Ori? Yeah, it's, you tell me. I, I like Ori. Mm-hmm. It's it, my full name is Oriana, but I find it to be like too much. So I like Ori. <laughs> it's my short thing, like you with your bio. It's our thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, good to have you, Ori. Uh, yeah, pleasure. I mean, I've been a huge fan of your work since I encountered you. Uh, well, encountered you via your work. So yeah, good to have you. Uh, yeah, but I guess the best way to kick off is you know just let you know that you are a blank slate to me. I mean, I have done my research as much as I can. uh, And I I, I put a lot of work into my research. I, you know, just check through the internet, you know, and stuff. But I couldn't find anything on you. Oh, this is beautiful. You're in for a big (laughs) treat. You're you're about to be shocked. You're (laughs) about to be shocked. Okay, that's good. Because the only thing that I found was your IG account. Okay. And even your website redirects to your IG. So, yes. Who is Ori Belladi? So I think you would have found something with the right keywords because Ori Belladi, even though I'm a toy maker now, a toy maker in the making, I'm actually a chef. So, bam, yes. If you would have looked like Ori Belladi chef, then you might have seen something, but yeah. Have you heard of imposter syndrome? Yeah, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> that's me in a nutshell. Every creative, I think. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I think I just changed um, creating a dish. When you have to create a dish, I, I like to sit down, think of the ingredients, draw it, try to make it make sense on paper, then reproduce it. So, yeah, I just changed one form of art for the other. Hmm. So are you yes. saying that you're a chef in real life? You may- I am, I've been a chef for the past 16 years in real life, <laughs> but I did quit, I did quit. I, oh. I went through a really hardcore mental breakdown. I was on the verge of why am I in this world at this point? Mm. So I took a step back. It was, you know, it's hard, it's a hard career. It's a really, really hard career. And my last position was as, an executive chef, I was the executive chef of a luxury brand hotel in Amsterdam. I won't disclose, but it was a really hardcore job. I liked it and I loved it, but I enjoyed this so much more. Hmm. Yeah, so I left so how- cooking. I left cooking, I ended up here. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand how did, you, how did you come about the intersection then? You know, how did, you know, being a chef for 16 years, suddenly cross path with, you know, 2D or 3D art, 3D pa- I mean, art basically. What yeah. happened? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so my man, my man, he's an artist and he works, he does illustration, animation, 2D, 3D. And while I was working, still working in the kitchen, we started fantasizing about having a 3D printer. And I was like, oh my God, this sounds like such a cool hobby. I wish I had time to do it. I wish I had time to learn because I I realized it was such a hardcore learning curve. Some things, if you wanna learn how to ride a bicycle, they're like 
really basic steps and then you can start writing. But for 3D printing, I couldn't find an actual guide or something that would tell me, okay, you have to you know, work for 40 hours or 60 hours and then you'll try to kind of understand. So I was actually really sad. I didn't have the time while working inside the kitchens to actually learn something that seemed so much fun <laughs> until I said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. Let me just take a little break because my mind is about to blow. And then that's when I started printing. Mm. Hmm. And I realized, hmm, I kind of like this. I really like this. I would do it. Interesting. Okay. So he was, um, you were a chef and he was an artist, right? Yes. And so, yes. So you would, so you were getting inspired by, you know, his, his, his walks then. Cause I'm, I mean, I'm guessing you would see him walking and things like that. Not only that, but, uh, once I started 3d printing, um, I started my account as a hobby account because I was just trying to do, which is what I did the first year. I wanted to recreate other people's work. So okay. I started reaching out. I had my boyfriend as a base start, but then I started like knowing so many other 3D artists and seeing their styles and trying to understand, oh, so this person has this style of modeling and this other person does this other thing. This has lore, this is a character. So this whole new world just opened up and I mm. was like, oh, wow. So I started the first thing I did, and I think most of my life is based on how a kitchen works. So when you start working in a kitchen, yeah, it, it would just make sense. It took me a little while to realize. But when you start working in a kitchen, any kitchen, you usually start um, cooking other person's recipes, right? Mm -hmm. You have some basic knowledge, like I knew how to print, I knew how to hold some brushes, but I had no idea of the actual creative part. So I started reaching out to other people, asking if I could please, please, pretty please, make their pieces for them and ship them. Just, you know, I just want to practice. So I yeah. did that the first year. I contacted a bunch of artists and I offered them, can I please, please, pretty please make your piece? And they were, of course, thrilled. <laughs> hmm. yeah. And I would, I would find people that will challenge me, maybe, um, some kind of a paint job I haven't done before, maybe some really tricky texture I haven't tried in my printer. So I would be like, hi, I have seen this character. It has really weird hair or it has this little tiny details. Can we print this? Can I print it and ship it over? So mm -hmm. yeah, first mm -hmm. I started with them. And then when I first got contacted, like the other way around, can you make this piece for me? I was like, hmm. <laughs> for money? No. <laughs> okay. Why would you pay? Yes. Hmm. Interesting. So it's interesting that you've gone from, uh, well, getting to know you has um, crossed path with my next question, what my next question was going to be, which was how you got started. But I think there's still some missing gaps there. So you've talked about painting. I want to understand you know, from the very start. So I know that you were working in the kitchen, but how did you even get into painting in the first place? So you you, you mentioned you have a, you had a basic knowledge of, you know, painting. How did you even, I did, mean, you, the, did the, you study <laughs> arts at all? In, I mean, yeah, this, we need to, because we need to demystify you. So these mysteries, that's the essence of this podcast, you know, let's get to know, I like yeah, I like let's it. get to know how you got started. Was it a childhood thing for you? Yeah. Was was a lot of YouTube videos. I think um, I think at this point in life, uh, that's the most accessible tool we all have for learning anything. You want you want to learn programming? Go to YouTube and spend your good 60, 70 hours watching videos until you drool. At the beginning, it was really terrible. I have to be honest. But and again, I, I always have to circle back to the kitchen mm -hmm. um, while being so perfect such a perfectionist with everything related to the work i give you know even if it's chopping onions or painting a piece um i gave myself the time and this is something we as a human species we don't tend to do that we don't tend to give ourselves the time we actually need 
to learn, process, and understand something. So I started painting with a rush. I started painting. I bought a set of 12 paints that were really bad paints. And I bought 12 brushes from Amazon that cost me, I think it was 15 euro. And I tried and I failed and I kept on trying. And I gave myself the time to actually try to understand what I was getting myself into and rewarding myself for you know, improving. So, so mm -hmm. how many times do we do something and just don't acknowledge <laughs> that we are moving forward? Not that we're being perfect. As, as, no, no, no. It takes a long time for that. Even though whatever piece I'm making right now, I make it with so many insecurities around it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, it has to be perfect. It has to be perfect. So yeah, I started with a really cheap set of paints, a really cheap set of brushes. Then I took the jump and I bought an airbrush, which I knew how to use because I had a little moment in life where I made cakes <laughs> just for oh fun. Oh my God. Just for fun. Oh. I didn't charge for my cakes. I didn't mm. like charging for them. So I had this friends ordering the most crazy massive cakes. And I was like, dude, I need an airbrush. And this, by you, I'm talking 10, 12 years back. And I was like, hmm. I could really learn how to use an airbrush. So I had this little airbrush affair that was completely useful at this point in my life. I was like, ha, huh, I know how to use this. I, I know how to use this. Yes, let's get an airbrush. <laughs> and then one spare room turned into a whole studio. So, Oh, wow. Is that yeah. what it is? Oh, is this, still, is this the same studio then? Yeah, this is my little spot. And it's Ooh. divided by... It's not in the best shape right now. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I, I've seen. I, I'm sure I've seen quite a. Well, not just me, but I think so many of us have seen quite a a lot of that on YouTube. Because oh, I said on YouTube on IG, you know, your videos, your live and stuff. You know, we're seeing things. So it's interesting, though. I mean, that intersection between, you know, your life as a chef, and then uh, we're talking cakes, and then we're talking arts. I can't recall ever coming across, you know, that sort of intersection, you know, haven't spoken with, you know, quite a few people, uh, but it's all good. In terms of your roles, you know, in terms of your work, right? So you are a 3D printer, right? Yes. Or, or is 3D artist or just, because you don't just they, print, They right? call it makers, mm. but I don't feel like make anything. <laughs> so but I think, I think it's that? too new. I think it's too new and it hasn't been categorized yet like people don't know what do you do you do you 3d print yeah i 3d print but i also paint but I, so yeah. i would define myself as a prototyper right mm. there uh, 3d printing has like a huge array of things you can 3d print really commercial models like marvel or anything commercial with a license you can print it paint and sell it and there's a lot of people doing that which is beautiful uh, but what I enjoy is working with artists and having a big background story for a character. I, mm -hmm. I might be too much of a sentimental human being. So, yeah, I really like making something that will give somebody total excitement, that will make somebody lose their mind. Yeah, I can make an Iron Man and I can paint it. And mm -hmm. I, that's, that's just not, you know, what you don't like. So I don't mm -hmm. like that. I really enjoy working with artists because being able to transform that thought, because it's just a thought. And then that thought has to be given to an illustrator and that illustrator is gonna put their own thought into that. And then there's gonna be, there's gonna come a 3D modeler who's gonna have to interpret the artist, like the first idea and then whatever the illustrator made, those illustrations, He's gonna have to translate that and then give it to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm like the last man on that on that line. And I love that. I love that. I love that usually it involves so many people to have one piece made. Mm. The the whole collaboration, the whole I depend on your illustrations and you depend on my eyesight because you know I, I have six different types of lights in my <laughs> studio, so I really have to interpret those colors. I'm like, huh, is this a broken white? <laughs> what is this? Mm. So yeah, I really this, enjoy that. This is really interesting because I mean, you just talking about it as it, it kind of, it, I mean, you resonates with me. I, I love the idea of bringing things alive, you know, going from the abstract 
you know, to reality, whether it be just a book or, or, or an app, just the fact that it starts from an abstract thing, yes. an abstraction. And every time I think about you, what appeals to me is the fact that you're bringing things alive. You know, you talk about bringing characters alive, bringing stories alive and things like that. And that's interesting. But you also touch on something that, you know, connects with my next question, which is processes, right? You know, what's your process like? Because I mean, we're talking involvement of different people and 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 you know and and, and skill sets and yes. resources, you know, yes, from yes, time yes. to money and stuff. So what's a typical process like for you if you were to bring alive my characters, which you will do in the near future, because we've been talking about this, right. what's that process like? So for bringing, let's say, Kute and Caroline to life, it takes months. And that's another beautiful thing. People, Some people have the idea that because there is a machine in between, it's going to be like, oh, there you go. Have this printed, painted, ship it over. No, it usually takes months to have a piece already here in the studio about to be painted. It takes months because of what we just went through. So for bringing Kute or Caroline or anybody from the accent, we want to bring them alive. The first thing we work is on the illustration. So we take the illustration. I personally love reading the stories. So I love when I have to make a character for a book because, you know, authors are usually really excited. Is their baby? Is their baby? And I love them as if it was my baby as well. So they share the story and I get to first, I get to know the characters, which I love. Then we have to work with a 3D modeler. So there's a big amount of styles to choose from. So what I personally do is if we have an illustration, there are several 3D artists that I work with. I tend to pick three or four that will or might match the same style of the illustration. And once we have picked them, we move forward. So this person develops a 3D model and then it's my time to make it shine. Hmm. So this, this process usually takes about a month, month and a half, the going from illustration to 3D model. And this is that money wise, this depends on the 3D artist alone. You know, it's the world. So we have different prices, different people, different parts. Hmm. Um, and then when it comes to me, it's all about printing, which is not hard-ish. It's not that hard. You know, I just have to sit down a couple hours in front of the computer, try to make it as printable as possible. These machines, they work, they work weirdly. They work, um, they print the pieces hanging from the base. So you have to make sure that the plate where you're printing can hold whatever volume this piece has so it's quite interesting to make hmm. it work so after it's printed here comes psychosis hmm. which is me sanding them down to perfection printers yeah they have a lot of detail everything comes out so beautiful but they do have flaws and sometimes they come out with some printing lines i have to drill holes in the figure so all of that before i put the first coat of primer all of that has to be sanded down so it usually that's one of the things that takes me the longest because i have to be extremely careful that it's ready for paint if you start painting the piece with the airbrush mm -hmm. and you don't see any type of flaws you're like oh this is going to come out perfect first coat of paint all the flaws come out mm -hmm. and if if painting is hard removing the paint is even harder <laughs> and i, <laughs> I, I have been sitting there oh my god it's terrible because some crevices you just can't reach to remove the paint so it takes me quite a while to make it perfect and then the whole painting process there is um people love taking shortcuts but acrylic paint really needs to sit down, rest, and grab to the figure. So mm. in between every, not layer, but in between every color, I give the piece at least one whole day to rest and dry. And you can, oh, wow. 
if I had you here, I could we could do the experiment because I have done this quite a few times. We can <laughs> paint a piece, put it there. We can paint the other one. We're going to leave one of them to rest for the whole day. And we're going to keep on working on, you know, the first one, just another color and another color. Hmm. There is a massive difference. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's a weird thing, but there is a massive difference. Interesting. So the technicalities here. So um, so I understand the bit, you know, illustration, 3D modeling, and then the first thing you do is you print, and then you do the sanding, right? What's that sanding? Is it like using sandpaper? What, what's that? Because I know yes. sandpaper, but what's sanding? A lot of sandpaper. So mm. I start with a maybe a 400 grit, and I go all the way to 2,500 to 3,000, because I like polishing in the end. Let me see mm. if I, hmm, yeah. I don't have any raw resin pieces around me, oh, but okay. yeah, that like the final, the final stage of the sanding, it has to be polishing oh, because so we, like... we need the piece to be extremely smooth. You know, when you, if you put ink and you, you know, you start placing your fingertip, it's just like mm -hmm. circle, 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 circle. Mm -hmm. The pieces come out of the printer with that. They come out with fingertips. They look like fingertips, oh, fingerprints. Interesting. It doesn't bother everybody, all right? It doesn't bother 95% of the people that I've seen out there that do 3D printed. It, it apparently doesn't bother anybody. And I think that little detail is what makes what I do slightly different than whatever you can find out there. Okay. Because I really take the time to... My goal is to make that look exactly like the render. I, I And hmm. this is going to sound silly, but... The best compliment I've, I've got was, oh my God, I thought I was looking at a 3D model. And I was like, boom, that's exactly <laughs> what I was intending. Yeah. Yes. I mean, but it shows how much details you put into the whole process. Because again, it's, ha I, so I, before we had, before we got, before, before today, right, I would talk to people and be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm having Ori next. And be like, and be like, and be like they'll be like, who is Ori? And I'll just, open up my, you know, my, my Instagram and show them the videos. Cause I am fascinated by them. And, yeah. and it's, and it's the same thing from everyone that I've shown. They will literally just spend the next few minutes just watching the videos, <laughs> you know, so you're, you're, scrolling there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you're taking people through your process and we're seeing the details. So even when you mentioned to me that it takes months, I'm like, yeah, I can understand why it would take months. Cause she's literally soaking everything in. Yes, you know. yes, yeah. yes. And you know, you know what's beautiful? Um, after every every piece, because you know, we're communicating, it's months of communicating. We start talking like I have this idea, but within two months, we're gonna be sitting down sipping coffee, like, yeah, I don't know if we should put that color there at all. So by the end of it, once you get the piece, and this has happened a lot, once you get the piece. I'm here in my house sitting down crying, watching you mm. open the box. And you're on the other side crying as well, like, oh, my God, I can't believe I have this. Mm. And that's the summit of the yeah. all, all the effort, all the effort. That's boom. The yeah. moment I can see an artist holding down their baby, mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm done. That's when I consider my job to be done. And I, mm. I've heard... These ideas, these characters, even if it's a book, a video game, whatever their background story is, they always have such a personal attachment. They're like, yeah, I have this character, but this character came, I had this experience when I was a child, or I had this partner, or this happened to me, and I get to know those stories firsthand. So really, you're going to think I'm crazy by you. But I sit down and I make these pieces and I'm so aware of what they actually mean to somebody. Hmm. That is just, wow, I get really, really involved. I try not to take on too many pieces because I feel it's a little unpersonal. I feel like I don't connect that much and I really love connecting with pieces. So when I take commissions, I try to work on two pieces at a time or one piece and then I'll work on the other piece because I really want to focus all of my attention. My studio, mm -hmm. uh, it, it becomes their studio. So mm -hmm. in my in my paints, where I have my paints, 
it's only those colors that I'm using, they're all gonna be down. And I know exactly which shades, which colors, like it's their studio. For three weeks, for one month, it becomes their studio. And I swear, this is so much fun. When I finish packing and they go out the door, I come back in the studio, I make a nice coffee, and then I start picking <laughs> out. And the fun part is when I have to pick up the paint. Mm -hmm. Because I always think, when am I going to see this combination down here again? And it's mm. like that, that little train of thoughts. I'm like, huh, when is this blue going to mix with this other one again? Or when am mm. I going to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really love the pieces, man. This is interesting. I mean, you are so invested in what you're doing yes. and it, it speaks to, you know, purpose, emotions. And look, I could literally have five, six, seven, eight people doing the same thing, you know, and I would settle for you because of what you've just said. And this is the reason, no, this is why people buy, why do people, cr I mean, you can find a coffee shop, maybe just by your doorstep, yeah. but you'd literally cross, or even ride a cab to the one that is your preferred one, you know, for yeah. some reasons, you know, it doesn't matter what the price point is or anything, yeah. you know, because people, I guess we don't talk a lot about why we do certain things, but the the why is, a, is, is as important as what we do, you get, and you're just, and everything that you've just been talking about speaks to your why, you know, your, you know, the backstories, the, the things, you in terms of the the genres that you work on do you only focus on like you know children's books or your works cut across different genres i i work quite a few different things so i have this audience who is trying to develop art toys so this is great because it's usually artists that have been trying to come out with their essence and then they have me to translate that so mm -hmm. that's beautiful Book authors are one of my favorite ones because of that, the lore behind the character, the book, all the struggle. I have learned what the struggles are for an author and how hard it can be to bring your idea to life. So boom, that's one of my favorite ones. And then I have another type of client that also have their lore. I have a really specific one that has a, uh, video game it's some sort of an mm. app i am terrible with video games i don't i wouldn't know how to press really no yeah oh i'm <laughs> terrible i'm terrible That's i got cool. i got lost in zelda ocarina of time like i don't mm. know 20 years back i don't know but um for this for that specific client we reproduce characters from the game and mm -hmm. each character is so different from the from the one previous that is like wow hmm. but my favorite one is gonna be book authors ah okay yes. especially dapo dapo in that wow dapo <laughs> because i get so emotionally involved mm -hmm. i i i had to call i had to get extra therapy sessions to work oh, on wow. dapo girls because it touched so many fibers inside of me working on this four little innocent girls mm -hmm. it was really really hard not mm. not not only the paint job which was delicate because they were small pieces mm -hmm. and they had some um manual salad, some freehand details which mm. you know i could i could deal with them they have so many different colors like mm -hmm. such an ample palette but seeing them playing with a broom mm. yeah they came out really they came out really well so, and i think I yeah, I think it's from a different book. I can't recall what the name is, but it, they're not yeah. in a book. They're they're ah. actually yeah. Dapo had that image, and he's been bringing them to life since oh, 2017. Okay. So oh, for him, okay. it's been a way longer journey. Ah, my bad then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they Ooh. don't have a name. I just call them the girls because they're the girls. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So the, he has he has some future plans for them. But what he actually wanted was. He wanted to be able to have them and touch them and see them and you know move them around as mm -hmm. I think we we would all like. Yeah, yeah so I can imagine, yeah. So so speaking of printing, I mean, you've talked about working with this um, video game uh, designer or maker or you know. It's a brand. It's, it's no, been a brand. for sixteen years, I think. Ah, 16 They've had years. the game there. Yeah. Ah, okay. So my question is, 
because when I think about your works and when I look at the things I see on you know on IG, they're usually like individual pieces. Yes. What are what are the what are the chances of having what you're doing in in volume? Because I I'd imagine that a brand would want to have, I don't know, we're talking tons of millions of or these things as as much, right? What I do what I do when people want to reproduce the the figures because it does happen. Uh, people mm -hmm. are like, oh, I really love the prototype. Now I want a thousand. And I'm like. Mm -hmm. I have a few um, contexts in China at the moment, which are factories that make nice toys. But don't tell anybody I've been learning Chinese for this <laughs> past year because at the Dianhua how much you do a I just ask for your phone number. Don't think I'm too fancy. <laughs> but yeah, I've been trying to find a proper way to make business. Uh, ideally, Ideally, in another mm -hmm. world, we would mm -hmm. be able to produce massive amounts of a toy in the European Union. But at this point, nobody seems to be doing that. Mm -hmm. Not as well made as we want it. Because I, I've been, every time somebody says, I want to have a thousand of these, or I would like to have a hundred of these. And I go to Chinese, the Chinese suppliers, yeah, I get good quotes, but you cannot supervise the actual attention to detail that they have there because you're, you're not there. Yeah, they're not you also. <laughs> exactly. And you have to wait until this huge box that you had to pay extra taxes comes to your house and you realize that that line was not mm -hmm. painted. And you're like... Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm actually trying to work on a way to make it here. I don't do reproductions. I, I don't have the space, the material, or the time because I will feel it too. It, um, it's not personal anymore. You'll be yeah. like, okay, let me paint this, let me, and just for the sake of money, I wouldn't do it. Mm. But maybe in the next year, hmm. I think I, I, I project it that way. Maybe in the next year, we will mm -hmm. be able to have some sort of a factory here. Okay. There are big, big printing machines that we could bring over and you know having maybe a small team of people painting the pieces and mm -hmm. having really good quality control i think i think europe needs that it, it's just i see everybody just going across and flying and getting their orders in china and it's such a lengthy process you have to you send your idea to china they send you a quote then you pay for that quote then they send you a prototype that you have to correct, I've seen too many people showing their prototype like, yeah, mm -hmm. huh, but this is mm -hmm. not the right color. Mm -hmm. So you have to blindly trust that they will correct everything you said and then that they're gonna ship those thousands of euros back to you in perfect condition. So I mm -hmm. really think we need something in Europe that you could actually visit can you imagine that? I'm making your Beautiful. characters and we're making little two packs of, you know, and you can mm -hmm. come over for a really, a really cheap tr ticket. You can be yeah. for a hundred pounds. You come to, to the factory, you can see your figures, you can, you know, assess the quality yourself. I think mm -hmm. we really need that here. Hmm. And people think there's no audience for that, but there is a lot of uh, yeah i've been calling some spanish brands that work with 3d printers and everything and i don't know if it's because i'm a lady or i speak weird spanish but they <laughs> all end up laughing at me what yeah hmm. i've been i've been inquiring i've been inquiring and they all tell me no there's no market for this there's and that's where i realized they are not doing hmm. or seeing or talking to the people that i am talking and you know working yeah. with hmm. Because I would imagine that, I mean, what you're doing, I mean, toys, right? There is a huge market for toys and they're printing these toys in, well, they're making these toys in China yeah. for the most part, I think. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But my, I have a question. I'm going to walk back uh, to, to the question I asked about processes earlier. I mean, because we talked about the personnel involved. I think the missing piece, again, uh, one missing piece that we didn't touch on was, you know, tools. So what kind of tools are involved in this, you know? And as, as the part B to that question is, um, is it a different tool 
for what well, I'd imagine is a different tool if you're if you're mass producing this. So, but just walk us through what kind of tools are involved even at this point, uh, where you work on stuff individually. At this point, there's a lot of at the stage that I'm standing at, there's mm -hmm. a lot of tools and money involved. Um, because you do need a lot of machinery to make it comfortable enough. Why? Um, 3D printers are cheap. You can get a decent 3D printer for maybe 250 quid, which is it's fine. It's fine. It's not cheap, but it's quite reasonable. Yeah, but yeah. to operate that machine, you need to, or I would encourage you to, <laughs> you need to get a washing machine, which works with isopropylic alcohol. Isopropyl? I don't know. Really hardcore, 99.9% pure alcohol that on itself costs a lot of money not it's a lot sorry, of are money you, are, you, are you joking or are you serious yes i work with gas masks and nitrile gloves i have to wear a really special apron and special shoes to walk into my printer's room it is extremely toxic okay wait hold on so <laughs> <laughs> okay so hold on so 3d printer washing machine and then you need a curing machine why because this resin is she reacts to light a really specific wave of light which is 405 um uv light not all uv lights are the same so this one works on 405 and after you wash them really good with alcohol and try to remove all the excess resin you have to cure them depending on the size of the piece and the wall thickness a few factors you have to cure them for a few minutes okay. and then it comes the sanding funny enough the pieces are printed empty you know because the the printer you cannot stress it enough okay go Ori, hold on so again again there, there are many people like me out there who understand jack which is nothing about yes. some of these terminologies so you print an item using, I don't know, they have, it, it has its own sort of materials, I suppose, threads and I don't know. Uh, it's, a, it's a liquid. It's a beautiful liquid. Okay. So is that the liquid that is toxic? Yes. The gas wow. that the liquid produces once it's it heats up a little. Because, uh -huh. yeah. So let's imagine we have a little tub, okay? A recipient, a tub. Yeah. And that's what we fill with liquid. Mm -hmm. Under that to top, to toxic liquid, very a really, toxic liquid. really toxic cancerogenous liquid. Yes, which is why you use your gas masks and gloves. And okay. exactly. And if mm -hmm. you if you get any droplets, you have to uh, clean them really fast and use something that cuts grease because it's a greasy liquid. So you cannot have that grease remnant there in your skin if you expose yourself to the sun it starts hurting like mm. you're being burned because you're actually being chemically burned by the resin reacting to the wavelength hmm. yes it's beautiful come on well so okay we have the top we have the top with the liquid under that we have a 405 lamp that lamp i i I have to work the pieces, the model. I have to run them through a slicer, which is the software we use mm -hmm. for printing. Mm -hmm. And that slicer is going to cut it in slices, whatever thickness I tell it to. And that screen is going to show each picture for each slice, maybe 4,000 slides. And each time that light, there is a platform mm -hmm. in the tub that's helping solidify that single picture. Oh, okay. Layer after layer after layer. So hmm. yeah, it's usually between 2,000 to 5,000 layers. It depends hmm. on the model. And that will give the printing hours. Yeah, I was going to ask you how long that process will take, uh, normally takes, rather. It depends a little bit, but I'm going to average it maybe 15 hours for print oh my goodness 15 yeah. hours you're sitting down there well you're not sitting down there watching it oh i do enjoy it though hmm because it's like magic <laughs> you do oh have to watch God. the machine at least the first five minutes you have to watch it because 
you know, when you're in an airplane, takeoff and landing, those are mm -hmm. crucial. It happens like that. The takeoff of the machine is kind of crucial. Uh, mm -hmm. It has a really thin, plasticky, papery thing. Mm -hmm. It's called FEP. It's just a plastic membrane where it releases each layer <laughs> and it can break in the first layers. Okay. I had that happen once and it's mm. just a disaster because, you know, all this toxicity is just spilling all yeah. over. But you have to like watch those first layers, which I enjoy a lot. So I'm mm -hmm. cool if I have to sit down and watch it. <laughs> but you were in the gas mask, you're like, <laughs> you're darvating it. You're <laughs> I'm just trying to watch. It's, hmm. it's fun. I really enjoy it. Wow, interesting. I was going to say, so ideally, this podcast run for, runs for 40 to 45 minutes. We've spent almost 45 minutes just walking through your process. <laughs> and I'm enjoying it. But, huh, I mean, okay. Yeah, man. I don't even know where to start from because it's, it, like, it's a whole lot. This is this is 3D printing 101 in a sense. And, and I yes. can imagine it will be the same thing for, the, for most people listening to it. But it's fun anyway. So, uh, 15 hours on the average printing out, and then it goes into the washing machine. It goes into the washing machine. You, it has a tumble situation happening. Mm -hmm. It washes as best as it can. Then you toss it in the curing machine. You don't okay. necessarily have to have a curing or a washing machine. You can have a mm -hmm. little Tupperware with alcohol and just submerge and shake, mm -hmm. shake, shake. I have done mm -hmm. that. And then mm -hmm. you can cure them in the sun. Or you can buy a single lamp, a 405 lamp, mm -hmm. anywhere you want, and just stuck it in a box. You can. There's several wells, where, uh, ways to cure it and wash it without having to actually buy the machines. It took me a little while, but you know, I just try to improve the things yeah. every, every every little I can. Like mm. that terrible box. That's yeah, uh, that, with a. It looks like a lamp. Exhaust. The, yeah, it's an it looks exhaust. Like so I can I can paint with the airbrush and it just sucks out all the. Um, is it that white? Is it that white one behind you? Mm -hmm. oh, with okay. the tube, so it has a yeah. extraction fan. Ah, so, okay. so the pieces come out really smooth when mm -hmm. you're painting without it and there's no breeze. Mm -hmm. The airbrush will, you know, spit the paint, and then mm. it will create a little cloud. That cloud will have a little particle and that particle will come down and sit oh, yeah. on the piece so here's the thing right well i have about god knows 10 questions here that i haven't even gone through because we're just going off script but this is interesting because <laughs> i have always i mean the exciting bit about this for me is just letting the conversation dictate you know itself you know by way of flow and and i feel like we sort of captured a few things in between but i mean hopefully we can have a part two sometime yes, in the future but, definitely. The thing, but there's certain questions that i still have to ask so and these are not even in my script so health wise have you had any health care oh when i started printing i didn't know it was so toxic okay i had no idea that the fumes you were not supposed to breathe <laughs> or any of that. So I had the smallest printer. I can actually show you my first printer. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I have it here. Come here, baby. <laughs> because, oh, you know, I don't use her anymore. She's too little now. Oh, okay. Wait, show yourself. <laughs> oh, and I can that's show nice. you things from her. <laughs> okay. That was my first little printer. And I had it here in the studio. Hmm. And I started realizing that I had a bunch of headaches. Hmm. And it was usually when the printer was working. And that's with a little bit of research that I realized, oops, I think I shouldn't be breathing this. And hmm. it definitely stopped. And then I just took a lot of extra measures regarding all the chemicals and the alcohol and everything. It still hurts. Mm -hmm. uh, because I see a lot of people printing and manipulating the pieces, raw pieces with their bare hands. I have a couple of friends who do it and I'm always trying to remind them that, you know, life is short and you don't want to die from that. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but you end up creating, uh, like your body starts reacting badly 
to these fumes. So if you expose yourself too much, it's not like, oh, I've been exposing myself to a little poison. Mm -hmm. I should survive. No, it's the complete opposite. At some point, your body just with the fumes starts mm -hmm. reacting badly. You start getting like allergic reaction. Your throat starts, you know, you start choking. Mm -hmm. And that's when you realize you have to stop 3D printing. I know two people that had to quit, sell their printers, just quit what they were doing because they were getting allergic reactions to the resin. Hmm. Do you think that things will get better? Because I I remember the one of the last videos that I watched was you with demoing or showing us this new baby that you have. I shouldn't call it a printer. <laughs> the guy, so, the guy, yes. Yeah. So is it is it from your experience doing this and, and how many years now? It's um, only been three years. I'm stepping oh. on my fourth in a little. Oh, nice. So in your three years of doing this, what have you noticed in terms of the technology? Has it been improving? I think it's improving, but I, I don't think they're being, I don't think the companies making the printers are making the, their people, their public actually aware of how dangerous this is. Yeah. So they're improving the technology. Like it's really hard to print during cold times. If, if you have some cold months, the printers don't react the same. They have their thing. So mm -hmm. what they're doing that now a lot is that they're adding heaters to the machines. They are making machines print faster. So instead of 15 hours, you could have that same piece in four, which it all sounds beautiful because the technology mm -hmm. seems to be advancing. But mm -hmm. I don't see how they're trying to protect their user. You know, some some this last this last beautiful green baby I got. Mm -hmm. um, they do. I I was shocked, and I think I I said it in in my stories. They are really conscious. They have a long list of warnings. They tell you do not touch it with your bare hands. Do not expose yourself to the fumes. Blah blah blah. And I was really shocked because this is a kind of a new company, mm -hmm. and they are being more careful than old time the, companies yeah. Than, yeah like the, your regular companies i always work with one that's called anycubic which was my first printer and all my other equipment is from them and they don't seem to tell their people to be careful about it they don't seem to of course and i understand this from a marketing point of view you don't want to make people scared of using yeah. your products but yet you don't want people this is terrible by you it's not only the toxicity. Everything I use that has mm -hmm. touch resin, we're talking mm -hmm. about gloves, paper, you know, clean mm -hmm. paper, paper towels. Yeah. Everything has to go through the curing light before it's disposed. <laughs> so we're talking that I have in my printer room, mm -hmm. I have plastic bags of cure residue that I have to then drive to a really specific location so they can dispose because this is toxic. I cannot just yeah. throw it into the landmine. Mm -hmm. uh, no. But yet you see people taking their prints and washing them under running water mm. in a sink. This is like... Because they don't know any better, right? You could just get a bunch of Clorox and drink it. That, that, it will be mm. easier for you. Don't do this. Not only that, what you're doing to yourself what you're harming, the way this harms water. And there's been, there's a study about this, especially it's been conducted in the United States. Mm -hmm. They are checking since the proliferation of 3D printers, resin 3D printers, they have been um, checking the residue water quality because mm -hmm. you know, it's residue water. They, they expect certain things to be found in that water, but mm -hmm. now they're finding this chemicals that are not supposed to be in that water. And mm. yeah, it's really toxic and it's really hard to remove them from the water once they're there. And so, this is because people are disposing of these things illegally? Yeah. No, because huh. they don't care. They don't care. They don't so care. instead of having your little tupperware with alcohol, washing, you know, being careful about what you're mm -hmm. doing, people just mm -hmm. take them, they run them. Um, so you've seen the pieces have supports, right? They have these little sticks and you have to break them. Mm -hmm. uh, the easiest way to break them, if you don't have a good configuration for them, is mm -hmm. with hot water. So you can take a little Tupperware, heat water, and place them there, and then remove the supports. 
that might be too much for some people. So they just turn on the hot water and they run them under the hot water in the sink. And then they Ori, so, Ori, so I lost you there. What's this thing that people have to remove using hot water? Oh. Take that again. Yeah. What's that Support. thing? Supports. Is so, that, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be a hard one to explain. But hmm. the pieces, depending on what the piece is, mm -hmm. it needs to be. I'm trying to find something with supports here, but when, everything... when, you, when you say piece, this is the final product when you've done the sanding and painting and that, and then, ah, now, once it comes out of the printer and you okay. remove it from the printer, it yeah. has support, which are mm -hmm. just small pillars mm -hmm. to hold the, while it's printing in the printing process. Remember mm -hmm. it's printing upside down. So you yeah. need to give it pillars so it can hold the figure. Mm -hmm. To remove those pillars, some people find it easier under hot water. Mm -hmm. But if you put it under running hot water, then you're killing uh, the environment. Yeah, yeah, because that water is going into the you know the the drains ends up in I don't know everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. Even even if it goes to um not a recycling, but this this facilities that clean the water and then mm -hmm. bring it back, mm -hmm. it is almost impossible to remove those chemicals from the water. So mm. I've had a few arguments about this on, online. <laughs> I like Do to you... fight with communities. Ah, I was going to ask you, because of what you do, though, have you been in a situation where you have direct conversations with these manufacturers? Yes. Are you... OK. And you do you talk about these things? Do you because I would because you you seem to me like an advocate, you know. I mean, an advocate for yeah, Thank not just 3D <laughs> printing, but I mean, even safeties and 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 being conscious around, you know, just being safety conscious around, you know, its use. So uh, do you what's your relationship like with them? Uh so what they do, the big, big brands, they don't care much. They really <laughs> don't care much. They just want to sell. And even they have this whole they just keep on bringing new printers and new printers and new print. They just want to. They just want to sell. They just want to make money, and they don't. They don't care if you're doing it under the sink or not. They honestly don't care. But the new brands like this from the big green printer I just got, they mm -hmm. do care. They do care, and they love feedback. And because they're starting, they want to build. Starting this specific this specific specific company started in 2021, but they love that feedback because that's what's going to guarantee them more clients and more it. money and better feedback. So yeah. yeah, I actually, when I talked to this company, I told them how amazing it was that they had so many warnings mm -hmm. regarding the resin, the printer and everything. And they're, they're like, yeah, we want people to be aware and conscious. And I'm like, <laughs> Interesting. Company. I like yeah. it. A hmm. uh, quick question on that one. How did you even first find out about how toxic these things were? Because when you started out, you were just, I mean, you didn't know any better. You were just, you know, was, was this again YouTubes and... Wow. Yeah, and, and you know what happens is the information out there is really biased. You can find, you find a lot of YouTubers or a lot of people in the printing community that have these printers gifted to them. So their opinion and how they sell these printers and how they translate this information is not that honest so yeah. sometimes you like you will see that green printer and you're like huh let me go find some more information and you will dig down that deep hole on youtube and you will find people talking wonders and maybe one out of ten will tell mm -hmm. you how toxic this is maybe one out of ten or one out of six you will see wearing an actual mask i had uh, i posted a video on tiktok the last Video, the last video I posted, I had people criticizing me because they didn't see me wearing the mask. I'm, my face is nowhere to be seen on that video. I'm wearing mm -hmm. my nitrile gloves. I'm just mm -hmm. touching something. And the first mm -hmm. comment is like, you should be wearing a gas mask. Mm -hmm. I remember actually feeling proud that somebody was being so aware that this mm -hmm. is a toxic thing. And I'm like, yes, my man, not only a gas mask, remember to wear nitrile gloves. If you wear latex, it gets melted by the resin. It's really disgusting, by the way. Hmm. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's fun. I actually have a little video that I'm editing right now and it's me like 
stop yeah. beware if you're using this machine remember to wear you know hmm. face protection and yeah so in terms of cost them um, ori we're not just talking a 250 quid printer here we're talking gloves we're talking electricity T tell me about electricity it doesn't consume that much that was one of my ah, first okay. um concerns because yeah okay. if it takes 15 hours 10 hours 20 hours printing you're like hmm no mm -hmm. um they are not they don't consume that much actually mm. you don't you don't see a huge fluctuation uh when okay. it comes to electricity but you do have to invest a lot on every little trinket so yeah it's not only the machine and mm -hmm. 250 we're talking about basic machine with a small printing platform which can be good if you're developing a toy mm -hmm. or if you want to do some prototypes at home it comes up perfect the big green machine it's about 800 so mm. that's just like the next level because this is a medium to big machine so it has mm -hmm. a bigger printing plate it has some features but mm -hmm. yeah printer alcohol which you have to get from like a chemist store it's it's weird mm. you have to call some weird numbers on this um curing machine or curing lights gloves and we're talking a lot of gloves hmm. a lot of gloves paper towel really necessary paper towel uh, these are all disposables right you're you, you finish with one project you dispose of them you're going to get new ones for the next project yeah and and sometimes you're printing and let's say i go into the printer room i you know new gloves so i'm i'm starting I start working with a printer, I get resin. If I have to manipulate something that it's already cured or already washed, I have to immediately just remove those wet gloves, get new gloves. So you're constantly consuming things. Mm. It's a nonstop wheel. And then mm. when it comes to paint, that's just uh, another bunch of money. <laughs> mm. But all your like, all those things, do you source them locally in, in Spain? or do you Yeah, have I did my best them? for that. Ah, okay, nice. So you don't exactly have to source anything from abroad, in which case you're spending so much time waiting or things like that. That's good, though. Yeah, I try to source everything from here. The only thing that's um, besides the sh the Chinese, the Chinese machines, mm -hmm. the latest thing I got from abroad was my new Japanese airbrush. Mm. <laughs> Just because I've been working with the cheapest airbrush, and mm. I'm I'm that kind of person that will say like it's not the tool it's the hands behind the tool yeah, yeah but i'm done <laughs> with the cheap tool it was making me so frustrated so i got yeah. a little better tool but yeah mm. i try i try to find everything here i have the chemist store that sells the alcohol um the gloves come from germany which i had a little complaint they have <laughs> this is tool you're gonna love this i've been wearing and buying the same german gloves for the past three and a half years Mm -hmm. And the last box I bought, I wear them and I'm like, huh, they feel slightly different. Okay, this is me being a complete psycho. And I'm like, they do seem a little different. I send the company an email. I'm like, I don't want to sound weird, but these gloves just feel off. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, no, you're crazy. They're the same gloves. <laughs> I weighed the gloves. I took 20 gloves from my old box and 20 mm -hmm. gloves from my new box. And there was a major difference in weight. So mm. crazy me, millennial crazy me is already emailing the company like, listen, maybe mm. you're the crazy one. <laughs> you should talk to your quality control because yeah. I'm shipping these gloves to you. They are not the same gloves. So yeah, mm. they're not the mm. same gloves. I try to source everything at least from Europe. Mm. That's interesting. I'm going to go back to a question I asked earlier about cost between printing individually as you do, and if you were going to do make you know make them in mass. Okay, yeah. if you make them in mass, um, they start with a mold. So the molds are usually made of nickel. I don't know how to say that in English. So it's that, but that's not. We're not talking. We're not. Are we? Are we referring to a three D printer in this case, but a different kind of three D printer? Or, or no. What what we're talking is, um, they usually don't three D print it. If you want to make them, and mass, if you want to make a thousand of them, is okay. more cost effective to have them plastic injection. Ah, I know that. Oh PC, yeah. Uh, yeah. Vinyl, okay. silicone. Ah, okay. So that's what they do. The ah. the most expensive part is the actual mold because mm. it takes i think it's about five thousand to make the mold 
five to six thousand to make them all. So mm -hmm. um, the good thing about the mall is that it requires just little maintenance and you can have it's a lifetime mall. Yeah. You can mm -hmm. have reproductions now and you can have reproductions in 50 years and it's going to be mm -hmm. the exact same mall. So ah. the actual figure is not that expensive. Mm. So the final the cost is yeah. not that much. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so for the most part, your 3D printing is pretty much good for, you know, a, a sample, a prototype. And then if you're going to bring it alive, you know, in, in I don't know, thousands or millions, you would have to then uh, manufacture proper. Which That's is how the Chinese it. work. But I'm I'm with you. I really like the 3D printing part, and that's what my imaginary factory would aim because they are so many different materials. I use a resin that's not extremely tough, not too flexible, but it will hold the figure. But there's some mm -hmm. resins, the better, the most expensive. You can buy resins for 200, 300 a liter, just mm -hmm. one liter. It's 300 euros. So I think personally that mm -hmm. 3D printing has way more detail than um, plastic injection. So can you do one million, can you do one million prints with 3D printing though? If you have, if not... you have a yes, man. If you have yeah. a printer, large printers are one meter mm -hmm. times one meter times one meter. If you yeah, have a ten how... centimeter figure, how many can yeah. you take in one time? Like a hundred of them. Ah, because I was also going to look. I was go, I was also going to mention the lifetime value of that um, printer itself. You know, because that would have. I mean, it would have its own uh, lifespan, if I may use that word. In which case, oh, it can only do this much before it breaks down or something, or, or not has, one of that counts. What happens is that the lamp will run mm -hmm. out of hours, so mm -hmm. the lamp has a lifespan. Lifespan, yeah. mm -hmm. and. It can, it's an average, so it can die before or it can die after. But that's the only thing you actually have to change. It's like all of my machines, they have that life spam. It's like a projector. You buy mm. a projector and you know that light bulb is gonna go for 3,000 hours. And after 3,000, it might die or it might hold on to another thousand. We don't know. Mm. That's, that's what the printer has, especially the large printers. My printers have because they're small desktop printers, they have a lot more consumables. They have mm -hmm. a lot of things that go bad and you have to change. Mm -hmm. And people from these companies, they think we all like <laughs> taking <laughs> machines apart and putting them back together, which I personally hate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's a lot of tinkering and touching and screw driving mm -hmm. and things that I don't enjoy. But oh. huge format machines work different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm telling you my machines, they print with the figures hanging, right? Mm -hmm. These massive machines, mm -hmm. SLA machines, they work down. They they don't mm. hang the figure. They build the figure from the ground up. Uh. They, it's really weird. It's really weird. And this technology, at this moment, as we speak right now, uh, they only have one machine in Europe and mm -hmm. is standing in Germany. And they are not using it for this. They just have like that display machine and you know they it's a factory thing blah blah yeah. blah the mm. fact is that these printers they have such massive sizes you can print a full-size human in one mm. of these printers you can print what? oh i want to print an, an alien and you take a 180 alien out of a massive printer they mm. have what's, huge capabilities what's the typical size like you know because it, it's hard to imagine when I see them in your videos, if you can, you show us a few characters and what, what's the typical? What's the I don't, average I don't size have like? many characters here, but uh, what, everybody you, wants a different size. Oh yeah. So what? Big? Can it be as big as my? You don't. I, can, uh, I have something. I have something you will recognize. I hmm. haven't painted them, but ba, 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 hmm. ba, but I have this little girl here. Let's see. Ba, this is only. Ah. I think she's thirteen centimeters. This is from this is from Dark Boys, right? Yeah, yeah. this is Dark Boys, baby. Yeah, that's not. She is that's ten. Not bad. Ten that's centimeters. Not bad. Yeah, she's really that's small. Yeah, because the reason why I asked is, I was thinking about my characters and I was like, hmm, when they come alive, are they going to be this small or this? No, which size? This all impressive. depends on you. Which mm, size would you like to? Okay, but ah. on as a contrast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have Nico, which was one of my latest babies. 
Uh, hmm. This is Nico's body, and this is Nico's oh. body next to the girl. So Nico, <laughs> just his body. Nico was um, 25 centimeters standing. Just the body is 14. Nice. So, yeah. Wow, this is amazing. Like in my, like I cannot. <clears throat> I'm telling you this, like in my head, I already see my characters sitting on my shelf and my daughter just playing with them. Here's what I'm going to do, Ori. What? Because we, we can sit down here all day and I will, Four more days. <laughs> I will literally just keep recording and enjoying this. I will rush through a few questions that I have just to make sure that okay. we keep things in balance. But yeah, so first thing for me is, uh, oh my God. What, what would you consider your big break? Have you had any big breaks, you know, and, and can you just pick a few high profile ones or? How come? I, I, I have, um, I have been contacted in a project that's ongoing that I cannot speak about. And so. it, it made me realize, it made me understand or see myself more as an artist. As I told you at the beginning, if you know imposter syndrome, this is me, <laughs> that's me. Just so many years being a chef, it's really hard to come to an understanding that so many other artists are acknowledging what you do as art. So mm -hmm. I got contacted by this huge thing and they have a huge project. And the fact that they talk to me as you, the artist, what can you do about this? And I'm like, I only know onions and potatoes. <laughs> You're putting a lot of pressure on me. So, wow. The, no, and working with so many people like Dapple, for instance, but you take people like Chris Chatterton, which is the father of this bear. Mm -hmm. The fact that somebody like Chris contacts, you know, makes that first, hey, can we talk about a character? For me, you don't know how big it feels. You, the fact that sometimes I'm working here, I'm having a bad day because we're humans and we all have bad days, terrible mm -hmm. days. And sometimes, and I remember this, I recall this happening exactly working with Nico. Um, terrible day, I'm sitting in my studio. I don't want to do anything. I'm listening to depressive music because, you know, life sucks. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking it. And suddenly I stop and I realize that me, yeah, out of 7 billion people in the world, right? And so many other people that have like a career on painting and prototyping and doing this. And it's me who's making Chris Chatterton's figure for his book release. Hmm. The moment of realization, it's always so, such a big slap. It's always such a big slap. Because I, 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 I tend to hesitate. Oh, are they going to like it? Does it look perfect? Mm -hmm. it, and it's normal. We're, we're still people. We're learning yep. and trying to navigate through this world. But every time I stop and think about it, mm -hmm. it's like a slap in my face, I swear. That's amazing. I, I always, I, and I jump on my boyfriend sometimes because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking about anything. And I will stop and... <gasps> Do you know who's working for Chris Chatterton right now? <laughs> and he'd be like, you girl? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interested. Uh, that's good to hear. <laughs> How about, so what are your influences? You know, uh, what would you consider your influences in terms of? Oh, I follow what? great artists. I follow great artists, which I think is a, hmm, this is a Spanish thing. I haven't mm. had to say this in English ever. It's a... Um, sword or a knife with it's a blade with double does it make sense in english in spanish we have the saying that something sometimes it's like a knife with mm -hmm. being sharpened by both sides okay the thing double, is, e double edged sword does that make sense something like that the, okay. the thing is that i follow people and i get inspired by people that i consider to be so big so big Mm -hmm. that sometimes I find myself comparing what I do to what they do. So mm -hmm. that's bad. <laughs> I try mm -hmm. to see them just as inspiration and I really want to reach their point. One of my favorite people is Gabriel Soares. He's from mm -hmm. Brazil. So he okay. can, my menos, talk uh. to you. <laughs> Gabriel Soares, he's a 3D artist 
and he started printing in his house and how he makes his toys, how he interprets the character, how he paints. Oh, wow, mm. wow. So, so this is a guy, huge artist. He worked with Netflix. He has like, wow, this is a person that you will. Oh. So mm -hmm. I sent him a message like a year ago or something. And I'm like, I admire your work so much that just by watching it, I could die. <laughs> I love what you do. Fast forward to now, we're working on releasing a collab in the next few months. So it's like so many adorable people doing this. Frank Montano is another one of my reference. Um, he has taken Star Wars, which is a whole universe on its own, and he made it himself. Like he, he made it his. He designed it in such a way that you can see any of the characters in that shape. And you're like, that's Frank Montano. Hmm. And that guy has such sharp lines and such steady poles. I could watch him paint for hours. I look at his, like you were telling me that if you scroll, you can spend a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I pay his Patreon just to watch him paint because the fact, and, and, it's such an inspiration. Sometimes I reach out and I'm like, dude, I had to make some straight lines today. And all I could do was think of you. And he's like, it's okay. You can summon me, you know, you can send mm -hmm. me a message if you feel like it. So, yeah, I, I try to look, I try to look up as much as I can. And I try to help anybody that comes with doubt. I've had mm -hmm. so many, do you have a YouTube channel? Do you give lessons? Can you help me out? Because I don't know how to my how my printer work. Can you help me out? Can it? And I have so many people on my DMs that I work with them on daily basis. I had this girl from Ukraine who mm -hmm. just reached out three days ago. She couldn't get her printer to print, and she has the same Anycubic printer that I have. Mm -hmm. She reached out. Can I ask you a question about the machine you have that I have? And I'm like, yeah. Fast forwards today to two days. Her printer is printing. She's extremely thankful. And I'm so proud that I got a girl from Ukraine yeah, yeah. to get her printer working. So I, it's a huge, beautiful community. I really oh, wow. like it. Interesting. And speaking of that YouTube channel and this and that, are you doing anything besides IG? Are you using any other platforms besides IG? I'm using TikTok because okay. oh, that earlier. Yeah. it's a really different audience, by the way. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I have yet to connect with. I think that's a that's a hostile side of social media, <laughs> right? Uh, and I'm all perky and all. Mm. Mm. So I really enjoy my my Instagram audience because mm -hmm. they're on the same line. I feel we're all okay. on the same line. But TikTok, mm -hmm. that's a savage jungle. I mm. post and I, 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 I run away from it. I throw mm. a video and I close the app and I close everything. And I'm like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> why, is that, why, why is that no, no engagement or, you know, I don't like the audience there. It's savage. Ah, okay. uh, they are really rude. Hmm, if I post something on Instagram, people are like, oh, that's a lovely thing. I post yeah. it on TikTok and they're like, why do you speak funny? And I'm like, I don't know. Why are you talking like that? I had a guy insulting me because I'm originally from Venezuela. Okay. Okay. So um, I said, it's not even a curse word. I said something that's vaina. Vaina means in Spanish, especially in Venezuela, means anything. Mm -hmm. This is a vaina. This is a vaina. Anything you, everything can be a vaina. So I'm, I'm doing the voiceover on the video and I say, la, 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 vaina. This guy sends me a message and saying, when does Latin American girls are going to learn how to properly talk? And I'm like, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> what's your issue? What, yeah, what, taking life are you? seriously. So yeah, people, are, I mean, people are, yeah, people can be, people can be crazy online though, because people are angry, I think, you know, people, people are yeah. frustrated. I, yeah. That's what I asked. I said, mm. I, I don't want to engage in any type of issue. Are you okay? Mm. Are you having any kind do you want to talk? Like, why is this triggering? You should get therapy. <laughs> yeah. Well, now that you touched on Venezuela, because again, yeah, these things come up earlier in terms of your background, right? But originally from Venezuela, talk us through that transition. Did you move from Venezuela when you were young? How did you You're going to like this. Oh, this okay. is going to get for a second part. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So 
I was born in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up there, left at 20, I think. That, yeah, uh, left at 20. I had just graduated as a chef. I had my first job as a chef, and then I moved to Spain. While being in Spain, <laughs> my first year in Spain, I didn't like it that much. Mm -hmm. I found them to be a little hostile, so I left. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I went to Portugal and mm -hmm. I opened two restaurants in Portugal. So I worked there for maybe close to two years. That's why I speak some Portuguese. And then I fell in love and I came back to Spain hmm. because why not? But then in Spain, I worked for a few years and I was like, mm, I'm not liking this. So I moved to India because that's a good thing about being a chef. You can, everybody's gonna eat. If they can access food and you make it, and they can pay, it's a good business. So I moved to India for quite a while as well. And then I moved back to Spain. And mm -hmm. while being in Spain, I worked for another while. And then I ended up moving to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So after some time in the Netherlands, I moved here again. So here I am. OK, okay interesting. So wow, man, there is Small a Small glove trotter. There is a lot to you, Ori. <laughs> I'm just trying to connect the dots now. So Venezuela, Spain, did you say, Portugal, did you, Spain. Did you say you started your restaurant? You so you started one from scratch? I, I opened the restaurants for the so what usually happens in the restaurant business is that the person with the money has mm -hmm. usually no idea how the business works. So they just put all the trust in you and you go for it. So I was 23 years and I opened mm -hmm. two whole restaurants from scratch in Portugal. Mm -hmm. Wow, interesting. It was a good challenge, yeah. And yeah. I, I'm not one to be scared of challenges at all. But moving to India, you just up and packed up and moved. Did you know anyone there? Did you? I get contacted by LinkedIn, which I think is the best platform. If you have a solid resume, it's how have a great I never, platform. So how, so how have I not found you on LinkedIn then, Ori? Maybe because you had to look for the whole name. Okay. Because yeah. again, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And you would and you I, would find you would have found my my chef profile, which is uh, it's me as a chef. So you still don't you still haven't updated it to? No. <laughs> do you not then still use it again? You, you, not only not... that, a lot of people in my life don't know what I'm currently working on. Except they follow you on IG, right? Yeah. Except no, I think I have. Um, I think I have divided my life. Okay. Because leaving the kitchen, just imagine, I have I have been doing that for so many years. It was my identity. Mm -hmm. We we take we usually take so much pride in our work. Some people mm -hmm. take pride in their work. Some people do it in their family. And I have been taking pride of my job for years. So it has been such a hard transition from being a chef and knowing what I'm doing, knowing perfectly what I'm doing, and, and learning new things and applying and knowing. I'm, I was moving like a fish in a pond, you know, it wasn't, it was my game. And then it's, it's really interesting because having to transition, mm -hmm. you, you have to cry for that old person. You have to bury that yeah. old person. That's I... another identity. That's mm -hmm. literally another person. So, wow, mm -hmm. it's been a huge transition hmm. and wow. you know, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I can tell you today I'm a chef. But for me to understand that, yet yeah, you have been a chef, which is fine. We can leave that mm -hmm. in the past. Now, let's try to build this new identity and try to find myself comfortable. Like, yeah. who am I now? I'm, am mm -hmm. I a painter? Am I a, a 3D printer? Do I work for people? Do I want to work for myself? How do so? This year's, I feel it's been a lot of constructing this new persona, which comes yeah. from my back because I'm still. Same old me, mm -hmm. just I'm not wearing a chef coat. But yeah. I'm not that chef anymore. Mm -hmm. Is there a chance so, that you will be someday, though? I have been called, and I've been doing some really cool things when it mm -hmm. comes to cooking. I had to make the biggest one I had to make was Thanksgiving dinner for a private club in Madrid. So it was like 120 people. And they called me about two weeks before. Hmm, Did you say Mali? Did you say Mali? 
No, no, oh. I wish. Madrid. Oh, okay. Madrid. <laughs> oh, Madrid. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, don't mind. This is my, yeah, that's the English pronunciation, right? Madrid, right? So, okay. So, yeah, so I still do some cooking on a side, mm -hmm. but very little. It has to be something like that. Like yeah. an experience that I, I know I will enjoy, surrounded by people that I already know in an environment, mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. that I will feel comfortable. So and, I just still cook sometimes. Yeah. And is that because, um, is that like a side hustle to sort of, you know, balance, you know, things for it? Oh, so it's just, yeah, for fun. Yeah. So literally, so literally your 3D printing service offerings take care of you. The self sustainable for you at this point, oh. yeah. I wish, I wish, um, to improve my speed. I find myself mm. because I take so much time looking at all the little details, I feel it takes me too long to complete a piece. Mm -hmm. I have tried to take shortcuts mm -hmm. and I end up investing that time I, I've cut, I, I end up investing it as well because I see the piece and I'm like, mm -mm. nope, it's not the way. So yeah. at the beginning, I thought maybe if I get a little faster, if I paint faster, then I can make more money. And mm -hmm. so one at one point, you have to you have to realize, no, yeah. if you want more money, you're going to have to sacrifice something and I'm not going to sacrifice mm -hmm. quality. So mm -hmm. it takes it's self sustainable. Mm -hmm. And there's some other projects on the side happening that I just don't share on Instagram because mm -hmm. NDAs and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. So, in terms of your service offerings, though, so three D printing. What else do you do and along painting, the lines? That's what I um, do. Painting. Okay. No workshops. No courses at this point. Future plans for for any of those? I there is a proposal to start a course in May to teach people how to process the the prints because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of three D printing information online, which I tell you again is not it's, yeah. it's a little biased, but you can find it. You can learn. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a clear line to follow though mm -hmm. so if you if you're learning spanish you know you have to learn this first and that and so for 3d printing is you just sit there with a bag hmm. looking at the <laughs> monitor and just you you try to grab everything they throw at you and then you look at it and you try to organize it mm -hmm. out of ignorance right because you don't know anything about this so you're like yep what does hmm. this even mean so hmm. I, I have this, so they have this proposal because they want me to teach people how to process the prints once they're mm -hmm. done. This is how it comes out of the printer. And it looks mm -hmm. perfect, doesn't it? It looks perfect, mm -hmm. yeah. right? You haven't yeah. painted it, but I love it. It looks perfect, but if you could look at it in more detail, it has a lot of little, little, little mm -hmm. flaws, little, little, little flaws. Mm -hmm. So they want me, I have this friend, and he wants me to teach people how to go yeah. crazy with perfectionism mm. so what's your future plans like then what are your what are your plans like you talked about a collaboration with one of your um influences most uh, favorite artist in the yeah. world <laughs> what's that collaboration like is that like you a teaching course or just a project that you're working on together we want to we want to work in a piece so oh, um, okay. yes i'm actually it, it's it's a little nerve-wracking because mm. For this man to think that I actually have the capabilities of doing something along his line of work, it's already <laughs> wow. Mm. So we've been talking about it and I always tell him I like to add little things, maybe one little bulb or some sort of circuit or something or have some motion. So we're still on developing phase. But oh. the most exciting thing that's happening right now is a an upcoming Kickstarter campaign. Hmm. I've been that working you're... for that me. It's mine. <gasps> it's mine. <laughs> yeah. So I've been working on this crazy idea with my boyfriend. Um, mm -hmm. It's been an issue. You know, when you go to Kickstarter, you have to have your cost really narrow down. You really need to know what's going to cost even to ship it, how much taxes you're going to have to pay. Mm -hmm. And I have contacted maybe five or six providers and none of them is willing to make the piece for me. Mm. Not even to give me a prize. They just look at the piece and they're like, yeah, it's impossible. Nobody does that. And I'm like, I know, I know nobody does that. That's why I'm contacting you to see if yeah. you can do it. So I've been even, I've been even thinking of acquiring a couple of machines 
that okay. were with metal and other stuff. So maybe I can make them myself. So mm -hmm. it's a big mm -hmm. stretch. I'm so people people going with their campaigns on Kickstarter praise them. It's mm -hmm. such a hard job. Mm -hmm. We've been we've been working a, for, on this for over a year now. Oh wow. We have gone through eight prototypes. I have contacted any provider you can think of people in china people in korea people in spain people in germany everywhere 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 and i'm like can you build this little thing and they're like nope you're cray cray wow. hmm. Interesting. Know, cray -cray. hmm it's all good though yeah so that's your future plans well and it's happening yeah, in the near future, because you've been working on it for some time now. Um, in terms of affiliations, do you have any, you know, organizations that you belong to or workshops or that you attend or mentors? Do you have, I would imagine your influence, uh, the influences that you mentioned earlier, like your mentors, do you, have, do you, do you see that's that mentor mentor yeah, kind of relationship? I, think, I just, I, um, I'm a really good observer. So I enjoy mm. watching people work. I don't okay. know if it's some sort of a voyeur kind of a mm. artist voyeur sort of a thing, but but I think that's where my mentorships come from. I mm. try not to ask or try not to bother that much, but I really take a good look at, at how people work. I yeah, I will come to a point to try and see how a person is breathing while painting, so mm -hmm. I can mimic that. And that it, it sounds like such a small detail, but by looking at that, I have been able to understand my own breathing and control it. So my lines are crispier. So I think my mentorship comes from psychosis, probably. Mm. <laughs> small okay. form of psychosis. <laughs> so Ori, where can people find you? I mean, people who are looking to work with you, where can they find you? Uh, they can reach me out on Instagram. Or I even have my email there, the Art Toy Lab email. That's mm. that's usually how we all how it all starts. If mm. I do start uh, coming out with some lessons, or maybe I'll find a, I'll give another ways to contact me. Or you can come knock on my door. I do live <laughs> quite far from people. So uh -huh. hmm. okay. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So so IG is the primary uh, uh, way to reach you, and and. In terms of your, even in terms of your own outreach, it's, it's still IG, right? I mean, all the people who have contacted you, you know, whether that be, you know, your the people you look up to who who, who you're going to be working with, they found you via IG, right? Correct yeah, me if I'm yeah. wrong. I've had a couple people uh, popping from TikTok <laughs> saying, oh my God, I saw this post and it was going wild and I found you, so I trace you back here. And I'm like, oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, um, yeah, I got a message from a huge brand mm -hmm. and they contact me through Instagram uh, with a really, uh, really anonymous kind of a profile. So, and that was fun for me. <laughs> it was why, like, hey. why, would they hide, why would they hide your, your hmm. true image? I think, I think maybe they thought, this is like if you're renting a place to have a party and you say it's a party, they will charge you X. <laughs> and if you say it's a wedding, they will charge you X plus. So I think yeah. it was around that line. Maybe if I had known or they thought if I had known which brand it was, I would have gone ah, crazy okay. because I could have gone crazy with the prices. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have, like I, that's not the point. I'd rather for me, it's already an honor. Mm -hmm. If I get the deal, which I'm, it's still pending, I should get a response tomorrow. If oh, I do right. get the deal, I will be completely mind blown. If I don't, mm -hmm. I am already mind blown enough that mm -hmm. these people knocked on my door and thought of me for making what they have in mind. Mm -hmm. So pff, I'm already honored. So here's the thing, right? Yeah. So here's something that just crossed my mind because I know we had talked about your potential availability being april or may for my characters so if you get this mind-blowing well amongst other mind-blowing projects that you've worked on and still working on um if you get that positive response tomorrow which i hope you will get what does that then what's the impact of that on projects like mine and and, and potentially other people who are waiting on the queue yes, for you. Yeah. yeah so i have i have a couple of people on the queue right now and i'm waiting for this email to see if i can clear them for may i'm already late like 
late May to start with new pieces. And I have a couple bookings for June already. <laughs> what I have talked with this brand, if if I get the deal, I'm, I'm going to close commissions at least for a couple months so I can okay. work exclusively on their pieces because mm -hmm. they do have some sort of a crazy deadline, mm -hmm. which I enjoy. Artists don't have those crazy deadlines. Mm. They're like, mm, let's make beautiful things together. <laughs> While this brand is like, and make them now. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, I told yeah. them that if we do get the deal going on, I think I'm going to close my commissions at least two mm. months and work okay. just on their figures because mm. they have a lot going on. Mm. Interesting. Oh. Um, this question, I mean, this is not part of my questions, but it's just popped up. What are the chances of you? So what are the chances of a brand saying, hey, we've invested this much in this space. We have all the tools. We have this, you know, we like to work with this kind of machine and da 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 da, da. Just come in and work with what we have. Is that a thing? Does that is that is there even a possibility? I would have to consider it. I would have to give it a thought. I've had mm. this offer, this whole factory idea that I just uh, shared with you. I had a person that knows nothing about 3D printing our toys or book off, nothing, nothing, nothing of nothing. And this person came and said, how much money do you need to have this 3D printing factory? And I'm like, I don't want to have a 3D printing factory right now. I really want to keep on working on what I'm working at this point, and mm -hmm. then I'll figure it out. So I've had some crazy proposals to scale it up to the next level. But again, I like how close it is. I like mm -hmm. that you and I have to sit down and talk for a couple hours about your girls and their story and how you came up with this idea. You know, mm -hmm. I want to be fed that lore. If we have a big factory, maybe I will get, you know, I will get the lore and then I'll have to translate all of these emotions and feelings to everybody working there. But I get your point. I don't think I will go down that rabbit hole or I could give it a little of my time. I think I would, I would be a good asset when it comes to quality control, because again, mm. the, the, mm. the, the attention to details that you put into it. Yeah. yeah. I think I it's fine. Yeah. A, a couple of factories that want to work along because I, I, I do get contacted by Chinese factories saying, we want to print anything for you. Whatever you want <laughs> printed, we will print it. And I'm like, I don't need it. I have printers myself. Thank you. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. We'll print it. We'll print it. We'll print it. But mm -hmm. yeah, mm -mm -mm. I don't like their quality control. Not, not all of them. You know, there's if you buy, let's say Disney, because it's like the most, if you buy a Disney toy, mm -hmm. there's different levels of quality. You can buy a really cheap figurine for two quid, or you can buy a really specific hand, mm -hmm. our toy for 300 quid. Mm -hmm. So they work with several factories. They're all in China. All of the factories will have Disney staple there. Ah, we mm -hmm. work with Disney. Yeah, but which level of Disney do you work with? Ah, interesting. I never do you wear with it. the cheap little figurines or do you make the really hardcore toys? Because they do, Disney has a uh, really professionalized art toys. They are beautiful. They're massive, the level of detail, and they are mass produced in China. And so are the ones that, you know, you take a little princess and they're like, mm -hmm. those are made in China as well. What tips do you have for other people out there looking to follow your footsteps, Ori? Honestly, I think there's one big piece that people you can hear you can hear this and you're like, yeah, yeah, right. Don't be afraid. That's a big piece of advice. Don't be afraid of anything and don't give a blob of other people. I've I've, I've been told by friends, people that I, I I consider friends. I've been told, oh, so this is what you do now. You paint little toys? Are you, are, what is that? What is that you're doing? You have a business? Who are you? That, wow, wow, <laughs> wow. Don't be afraid and don't give a blub about mm. other people. And, mm. and not only 3D printing, anything, anything in life. If you want to learn gardening, whatever you want to do, just invest yourself, invest enough time so you can learn and don't be afraid to try it. A bio, mm. I, I, 
not unrelated, mm -hmm. but I speak quite a few languages. And the only way I've been able to learn or at least try to talk or communicate myself in those languages is by not being afraid, and especially mm -hmm. not being afraid of what the receptor is going to think of me uh, the, 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 trying to speak their language. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Just trust yourself. Trust yourself and go for it. Seriously. For 3D trust. printing, for singing, for learning how to navigate a cruise ship and going to Antarctica. Just go for it. Go for it. And don't hmm. give a shit about anybody. Interesting. That's powerful. I couldn't agree more. More questions right off of right right off of that though. How many languages do you speak? I speak Spanish and English quite fluently, mm -hmm. as you can tell. <laughs> Uh, mm. I speak Portuguese, but I'm forgetting a little bit. I mm. speak Punjabi, which is mm. Northern Indian. I speak did you totally Punjabi. Did you learn that while you were in India? Yes, it was quite difficult. And yes, mm. but I did learn in how to communicate. So that was cool. Okay. English was where? School? Or? Um, I think I was born into English. My mom, mm. she, she was an English teacher, but... Mm. She never, you know, if your dad is a math teacher, he's not going to come home and teach you math, period. <laughs> yeah, so my mom is not like she came home and started teaching me. But she did this thing, which I loved. She used to um, speak English to her husband hmm. so that I wouldn't know what they were saying. Ha ha, jokes on you. You were teaching me English this whole time. <laughs> so that's. I think that's basically how I, I, I got the grip. You need to... You know, you need to get the grip of listening yeah. and then just traveling, traveling and mm. not being afraid and not not being afraid of committing mistakes and saying things that maybe mm. didn't make sense. Reading a lot. So mm. English, Spanish, some Portuguese, some Punjabi, some French. I do tend to forget it, though. And you're learning and, Chinese now, right? And now Chinese. Yes. Mm. <clears throat> Which is so much fun. I love it. I mm. love Chinese. I love yeah. it. I have one of these uh, Chinese factories. I have one of the one of their commercials, and you know we are constantly talking because we have this big project that might happen or not. So we're in constant communication. <coughs> and I told her that I was learning Chinese, and you know if she could send me some songs because that helps mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. So she did send me songs, and haha, the songs were in Hansi, which is you know the little the oh, weird okay. figures in Chinese Symbols, yeah. and I wanted to actually read them. So I was like, can you send me one that I can read in <laughs> pinging? So yeah, I've been getting a lot of Chinese music lately. I'm oh, going to wow. listen to it. They're too romantic though. Really? They're like heartbreaking people. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Cause when some of us, when we think about Chinese and uh, I don't mean this, uh, uh, I don't mean any offense, but you know, certain well, stereotypes like that you have. Thing. Yeah, certain stereotypes. You think of Chinese, you're thinking kung fu, you know. And so now, when you mention romance, that's a completely they're uh, so different. romantic ah, and they love okay. slow music. Okay, interesting. That's gonna be a fun one. Yeah. Ah, Let's okay. See how that goes. Yeah, I mean, questions just keep popping up. Uh, I missed one earlier, which I think is important because you touched on your family, you touched on your your mom. Um, so family background are your are your folks in 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 in, in spain uh are they i don't know so Shit. my dad's british oh, okay. but I, I met him i met him late in life and he oh, lives okay. in the usa and my okay. mom she does live in spain she lives in madrid okay uh, we do get to hang out quite mm. a lot because we mm. like each other a lot <laughs> <laughs> Siblings? and i'm an i'm an only child i do have a half sister Oh, okay. Which is adorable because she gave me a nephew. Mm, well, a niece. Right. Sorry, she <laughs> gave me a niece. So I'm I'm not I'm not I don't have anything against Kit, but mm. I don't want to reproduce myself. So okay. I do get to enjoy other people's children. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's the too one toxic bit. Here. Sorry. Yeah. It's too toxic here. It has too many gases. Yeah. Stuff. The one question I had, uh, which I think is important, is work life balance. Yeah, printing, printing, printing. What do you do besides 3D printing, Ori? I do a lot of reading. If you have to point a hobby, I love reading. And I love going. <laughs> so I think when I when somebody asks me, what's your favorite hobby? 
Mm -hmm. I always say it's learning new things. So okay. any rabbit hole I can get myself into, I'm going to go for it. So I try mm -hmm. to learn um, in between of taking care of my house and my family, which is my men and all my pets mm -hmm. and printing. I do enjoy learning new things. So mm -hmm. whatever crazy thing that sparkles a bit of joy, I'm going to pursue that. So I have okay. learned how to do embroidery. I'm not going to monetize it. I'm not going to be really good at it, but it does give me some joy. So, I'm, you know, embroidery, I read mm -hmm. a lot, a lot. Do you, do you have any favorite genres? Um, I read everything, mm -hmm. but my mm -hmm. most favorite book right now is Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Mm. And it's it's a beautiful, feel-good sci-fi novel. Okay. And I'm just sad it's over. I have read it three times already, so I'm not that sad. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, Project Hail Mary. If you like reading or listening to audiobooks, write it down because you're going to love it. Okay. It's not, it's not heavy sci-fi. Nobody's trying to kill each other. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> Check it out then. Okay. <laughs> wow. Interesting. I mean, Ori, I have... This is literally the first interview that I would have where I have had my questions mixed up, <laughs> you know. But it's interesting because again, it speaks to how how really exciting you know the conversation is. So yeah, um, yeah. So it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Ori. Same, and, um, thank you for inviting me. Thank yeah. you for having me and asking me questions. Yeah, no worries, and stay connected. Don't be a stranger. <laughs> yeah, totally. I thank you for listening to the end. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find all the links in the podcast description. Make sure to follow the Creatives Across Borders podcast and stay tuned for the next episode. Until then, bye.